Welcome to the Kelly Met Roundtable. I'm your host, Tom Roach. I'm joined today by my guest, Dr. Renee Conroy. Uh, we're here to talk about the aesthetics of dance. Uh, Dr. Conroy is a professor of philosophy with a specialization in aesthetics and metaphysics. Uh, she's been studying uh, ballet, jazz, tap, musical theater uh, most of her life. She has a bachelor's in philosophy and dance and a doctorate in philosophy, all from the University of Washington. Uh, she teaches in the English and philosophy department at Purdue University Calumet, teaching philosophy mm -hmm. and aesthetics, I would assume. Um, and she was a Fulbright Award recipient in 2014. Uh, Renee, uh, I think of dance and I think of letting go and being spontaneous. Uh, how, you know, how do you work that in with philosophy? It seems to me that they're contradictory. You wouldn't be able to dance if you were being <laughs> philosophical. Um, well, first, thanks for having me, Tom. And yeah. second, thank you for starting with that question, um, because this is, in fact, the kind of vexed position I found myself in as an undergraduate. Yes. Um, I was a philosophy major, but my philosophy degree was entirely separate from my dance degree. So I would spend the morning over at the bar in Meany Hall, and in the evenings in rehearsal, and in the middle of the day. This I isn't the bar where the other. No, the B A R R E. Where, where, where the other students were drinking. This no, is no, the no, one. no, no. Yeah. That was that was after yeah. the philosophy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, uh, we you know do our exercises at the bar, plies, tendus, spend your day learning about dance theory and history, and be really in that place where you are exploring creative energies and yourself, and you feel like you're being let loose. Yeah. And then I would wander across campus to go work on my very individual philosophy degree and think really hard about David Hume and the nature of reality. And I loved that these were completely separate endeavors. Right. When I was about in my almost the beginning of my fourth year of my undergraduate study, someone told me I ought to take a class in aesthetics. And I balked. I said, I don't want to take a class in the philosophy of art. It's going to ruin my enjoyment of my art form. Yeah. I want to keep philosophy intellectual and my art form much more visceral and personal. It's like taking a class in rock and roll. It just, yeah. There's something wrong it takes, with that. It takes yeah. all the spunk out of it, one yeah. thinks. Yeah. Um, but I had the most amazing aesthetics professor who had found a way of really bringing that joy that we experience when we're practicing in art into a much more refined kind of thinking about it that developed from the tools that I was using um, in other yeah. capacities. And I hate to say it, but I fell in love. And I didn't find in the main that it detracted from my enjoyment of being involved in the art form. Instead, it's really, really enhanced it both as a participant, but now even more, I think, as a spectator. So um, they can come together, but I think in part it depends on how they're in introduced well, to you. OK, so um, if I'm interested in dance, um, how do I apply my understanding of aesthetics to that? And how does that help me enjoy it more and appreciate it more? Yeah, so again, I was really surprised some years after I had gotten my bachelor's in both areas to discover that there were a group of people in the world who cared specifically about dance as an art form because it's one of the most underrepresented art forms in philosophical aesthetic literature. Yeah. Uh, so I thought, what would they be talking about that would be different from any other aesthetic theories? Right. But the fundamental foci that come together in the dance-related philosophical uh, material have to do with ways in which our interaction with dance, both as performers and audience members, seems to be different from what we do when we watch a movie or wander around a sculpture or scan a painting. Really? Um, and in particular, some of the things that are of great interest uh, at the moment um, have to do with the kinesthetic responses of audience members as contributing to their understanding of the content of a dance performance. And tell us about the, what, what is that? So uh, I gotta ask you. So when was yeah. the last time you saw someone, whether it's a formalized dance performance or just something less formal, sort of cut a rug and then feel yourself like tapping a toe, moving along, as though there is an energy that you were simultaneously, vicariously experiencing? Because they were dancing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Uh, actually, you know what? Um, I was at. Um, I think it was Friday night. I was at. Um, oh, good. A, 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 you know, a establishment in Joliet, they had uh, a, 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 like a 70s, 60s classic rock band playing. And the person next to me I thought was going to vibrate off of the chair. They were <laughs> bouncing around so much. Uh, and I, you know, and I sat there thinking, you know, I wish I could get that into the music that I could feel that good. But I, you know, it, that doesn't happen to me. 
So a lot of people who watch dance experience or report having the sensation of moving along. Um, there's a yeah. very famous story, for example, about Nijinsky having this amazing leap that hung in, in midair. Uh, we have no pictures of it. We really don't um, have any video, of course. But there are all of these critical descriptions of this wonderful leap. And you think, what made people describe it in this way? And part of it is that those audience members felt like they, too, were suspended for a second. Yeah. Um, and dance creators, choreographers report really trying to access the bodies of their audiences as much as, or sometimes even before, their intellect in terms of yeah. understanding symbols, right, that they might be seeing in the movement. So um, there's a very long history in the dance literature of thinking that what uh, John Martin, who was a famous dance critic and theorist in the early 20th century, called metakinesis, that this is the foundation of dance appreciation. One body speaking directly to another body and that visceral Interesting. Um, kinesthetic sensation doing the communicative work that helps us understand so the dance. Nonverbal communication, as we would say in the Yes. Communication department, maybe, right? Which goes even deeper than just nonverbal, but actually, yeah. um, on Martin's theory, to uh, the explicit experience of the exact same emotion being depicted in the dance. It's not just that I see it, so, but I somehow actually um, experience it. So you're it. saying that there's, there's potentially more of a transference here than you would get if you were just reading a poem or a so novel or something. This is why this is one of the areas that has had a lot of airtime in the philosophy of dance literature, because it does seem, if not particular to dance, very salient with respect to dance as an art form. Yeah. It's highly controversial. Uh, lots of philosophers believe that this doesn't exist, or if it did exist, it would be irrelevant to understanding dance as an art form or appreciating it. Yeah. Um, and currently, uh, there is a good group of us who are busy debating with one another about the relevance of cognitive and behavioral science studies that um, have been done on dancers and non-dancers yeah. alike watching movements that indicate that there is actually a degree of what they call firing in the mirror neurons. Mm -hmm. So that if I watch you doing a great yeah. soda shaw um, and you map my brain, it turns out that the part of my brain that would be active if I were performing it yeah. um, is in fact at least modestly active while I'm watching it. And so there's a lot of question about whether neuroscience supports the idea that we really kind of can communicate to one another bodily in a, in a direct way. Um, again, lots of debate about that. I think the neuroscientific studies are fascinating, but probably not philosophically relevant. But this would be one of these examples where dance seems to have something to discuss that might be a little different from, um, as you say, poetry, uh, yeah. drama, sculpture, maybe even film, though we're getting closer uh, in the film case, I think. Right, so on the spectrum, it might be closer to something like film that's more um, enveloping in terms of mm -hmm. the senses, right, that's giving you the images and the sounds and everything. That's, that's very interesting. Um, are there some kinds of dance that are more effective at this than others, or is it just, is it just the idea of watching movement? So um, I guess for those who have an across-the-board theory that there's something like this kinesthetic response that underlies our experience of watching dance, it would cut across all um, dance forms, right. which is why I asked you if you'd seen someone yeah. cut a rug last week uh, that generated yeah. that in you. I'm usually thinking, I hope they don't drag me up there because I'll embarrass myself. Yeah. <laughs> That's the second thought, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, but it's true that one of the interesting facts about the philosophy of dance is that those of us who are specialists in it tend to specialize in different dance forms yeah. or different dance styles. Uh -huh. So we have a member of our community who's very interested in Balinese dance. Um, I tend to be the person who is most uh, well versed in uh, modern dance forms from Lowy Fuller in the late 18 hundreds, almost 1900s, up through uh, what we'd call postmodernism in the 1990s. Some people are extremely focused on classical and romantic ballet. So one of the fun things about having all of us come together to talk about these things is that we're usually using examples from all kinds of different dance forms. Yeah. What's been left out a little bit to my mind are really fun things like tap. I mean, I think tap dance is one that really calls for an extra kind of attention because of the sonic element there that brings it closer to jazz music performance. Um, and also with the improvisational character that often accompanies a tap performance as opposed to, say, uh, a performance of Martha Grand's Lamentation or, you know, uh, 
Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> and does it does it give you any uh, insights or observations about a particular culture or subculture if they're more, you know, aligned yeah. with one type of dance or another? Are there any thoughts on that? So this is where I fall really flat as a philosopher of dance. Yeah. I hate to say it. Um, every time I go and speak, and I, I speak to different groups, um, sometimes yeah. people in dance departments, sometimes practicing dancers, sometimes philosophers, sometimes a mix. Yeah. Um, Usually when I go to dance departments, people will be very interested in knowing what I think about Haitian dance or right. Hawaiian dance. And, and I'll right. have to say, I think these are fascinating subjects, but um, we are experts in what we're experts in. And right. so I have to invite you to either bring um, your knowledge of those things to our discussion or um, you know, send me the relevant links and I'll go do some more homework. Right. Um, I think a lot of the things that we're interested in would cross cultural barriers, but but remember, we're mostly interested in dance as an art form and so as it's practiced as an art rather than as a folk art or as a social practice or as part of a ritual. Well, what's the artistic component here? Because so far we've been talking about how people can sort of embed themselves in the experience that somebody else is having, right? Mm -hmm. um, what, what's the art component of that? So um, this would be controversial, but just to say in a kind of ge general way, for philosophers of art, there's going to be a realm of um, cultural practice, usually, that okay. constitutes uh, art forms. And that distinguishes, say, the painting that Raphael did from the painting that I might do at home. Uh, and some of that is being embedded in an art historical context, meaning to be responsive to previous things that have been regarded as right. art, or offering things up um, as art form. So I charge you money if you want to come see my choreography, <laughs> right? Yeah, and yeah. sit you in the dark theater and pr provide a proscenium stage setting, all of which is designed to tell you, I mean this to be of a piece with the traditions of this art form. Right. Um, in addition to which, I might use really consistent vocabulary or refer to vocabulary that was sort of central in the development of dance as an art. And I'll just say as a side, so, as a side note, yeah. dance is the youngest of all of the fine arts, if it's a fine art. Um, very, very famously, some philosophers have denied that dance could be an art. Um, Hegel left it out of his system, for example, quite uh, pointedly. Yeah. And, um, Hegel was picky. He yeah. was. Yeah. But he, but it's also it's a it's a new art form, right? It didn't develop until, um, really, in the way we know it now, um, the 1800s. And think of how long many of these other art forms have been around. But dance has been around for you know yes. as, as long as people have been breathing and speaking, and mm -hmm. um, so so really, it's only new as a as recognized art form, art form right? Mm -hmm. But it's um, still and a, and one with ha that has codified practices right. and techniques. Um, of yeah. a piece with, say, drama or opera. OK. We're going to take a commercial break. The Kelly Merritt Roundtable will be right back. The Purdue Calumet College of Business gives you the chance to learn from a team of award-winning professionals, innovators, and scholars active in their field. You'll get an education from one of only 5% of business schools worldwide to be AACSB accredited, while joining alumni ranging from an award-winning news anchor, corporate brand manager at Morningstar, to an analyst at the World Bank. The College of Business at PUC is the first step on your path to success. The Purdue Calumet College of Business, thinking differently, making a difference. Welcome back to the Calumet Roundtable. I'm your host, Tom Roach. My guest today is Dr. Renee Conroy. We're continuing our discussion about the aesthetics of dance. Um, Renee, you, uh, you've written about uh, what you call dance work reconstruction. Can you explain that for me? Um, so we were talking just a little bit before about how new this art form is relative to others. So you might have expected that we would then have in our possession all of the major works that have been created since it became right. important to us a couple hundred years ago. But because of the way dances are made, generally on the bodies of the particular dancers who are there in the studio that day or yeah. at that time, 
and then the way that they're preserved, generally in body-to-body -body and mind-to-mind -mind interaction with people, as opposed to, of course, early on there were no films, uh, there was hardly any photography, and there's never been a codified language for keeping dance um, in a script form in the way that you might use for music, where we have a standardized notation. Um, there are a lot of movement notations, and different people have tried different ones, but there's nothing universal. Almost no dancers can really read notation. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you, as a dancer or a choreographer, want your work notated, you have to pay for the services of a really expensive specialist. So for the most part, dance continues to be passed person to person, and dancers are very interested in doing new things, what's coming next, what's the next commission. So you might perform a work for two or three weeks in a season, and then it drops from the repertory, and no one thinks about it again for 10, 15, 20 years. And yeah. finally someone says, hey, what happened to that wonderful work that got all of those great reviews? We need to reconstruct it because yeah. nobody really remembers exactly what the original was, though there'll be quite a bit of anecdotal evidence about it. We might even have some video footage, though that's not always reliable. Um, so the process of dance work reconstruction started really in the 80s with people being interested in reconstructing what were, quote, masterworks from the late 1900s. Uh, so, the late 1800s. So I'm just 1900s. surprised there, there isn't um, a lot of uh, film and, and video to work from. Is it because it just tends to not be a subject that people gravitate towards filming, or is it that it, it's not conveyed well, do you think? Uh, so I think there are yeah, two, different, two different issues. Certainly yeah. today, people use film, filmic technology quite regularly. Um, many of the masterworks we might have been interested in, though, were created before it was really available, right. um, or even when it was available, it wasn't very widespread. Yeah. So a lot of those works, um, consider the example of Swan Lake you might be interested in, the 1895 choreography by Petipa Ivanov, uh, Petipa yeah. and Ivanov. I know that was the one you were thinking yeah, of. Yeah, that was it. The canonical one, though it was actually created 17 years after the original one was done by someone else. We don't even know what that one looked like. But suppose in 1950 you're interested in getting back to Petipa's original choreography. Right. What do you have as a resource? You certainly don't have video. Right. You might have some um, images, you might have some photographs, you'll have the libretto, you'll have some notes. Um, but it's right. really um, an archaeological research project done by people who are also very choreographically savvy. So they'll research the history of these dances and the creators very deeply until they almost feel like they're embedded in that person's psyche. But they're and essentially looking at, at the written record at this point, right? That, that's right. And yeah. then they'll take what they've gleaned and try to put it together into a puzzle and look at the missing pieces and figure out as a choreographer yeah. of the present day working in that style how to fill in those pieces to give us a real living sense of our dance history. Um, it's a really interesting academic slash artistic kind of uh, double hat wearing job. Um, but it raises all kinds of issues. It, it hasn't always been well received by dance insiders because they yeah. think we're making museum pieces out of works that ought to have natural lifespans. It's well, also very expensive. Well, two potential problems. I mean, one is, yeah, maybe you're, you're, you're making these museum pieces, but the other potential problem is that maybe you're claiming that this is what you think they were doing, but it's not. This is your you know, idea of what it is, but maybe it's completely different, right? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so one of the central issues of my dissertation was about, you mentioned uh, earlier that I'm interested in metaphysics, was about yeah. um, metaphysical issues in dance as these emerge from considering reconstructions and the question of whether or not um, we could ever consider a reconstruction to be the very same work that one is right. attempting to reconstruct. Right. Um, I argue that the answer is no and that this is a really good thing. Um, but there are many theories about what we would call the identity conditions of dance works. That is, the things that have to be satisfied for us to get, say, Swan Lake again. Um, that would have it that reconstructions do count as the same work, even if there are substantial differences in terms right. of the step sequences. So uh, that was a central, this notion about identity conditions, when do we have the same dance again, um, is an element of aesthetic metaphysics, just like it might be if we were interested in personal identity. When do I have Tom Roach again? How much of your uh, bits and pieces mentally and physically today have to persist into the future for it to still be you yeah. when I see you next week? Uh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some people would say especially concerning me, but uh, right. <laughs> um, but um, you know, it, it, um, it strikes me that I've heard a similar discussion uh, to this um, regarding uh, the liturgy in the, uh, in the Christian church. Mm -hmm. the, um, uh, 
you know, the, I think the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church would claim that for years the, the tradition of the liturgy was passed down not because anything was written, you know, uh, uh, not because there was a Bible to refer to, but because of the, the singing and the, uh, you know, the sequencing of emerging from behind the altar and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, and um, someone uh, about 25 years ago, as I recall, was trying to recreate what they thought was a lost liturgy. Mm -hmm. And they were attempting to, you know, use this, and they were, uh, you know, criticized because. And the, the the point of the criticism was, we don't really know what it looked like. You're guessing, and so you have something here that may be, uh, you know, uh, apocryphal, right? Mm -hmm. um, but um, but it seems to me that in, in at least in the case of uh, aesthetics, if you've got the consensus of the. Uh, of other performing artists, if you've got the consensus of the critics, then you, you know what else is there to does it matter? Well, the the thing is, artists um, aren't that laissez-faire about uh, offering consensus, right? And very small differences in terms right? of yeah. performance so can make a very bishops. big yes. difference to okay. their conception of whether this is an appropriate reconstruction of a work or not. Yeah. Um, what's interesting is that the original people who sort of started this movement in the '80s. Uh, Kenneth Archer and Millicent Hodson, they were very concerned to only reconstruct, first of all, masterworks, um, but yeah. secondly, works for which they could acquire what they uh, described as a very high level of information density. They had these metrics uh, along which they measured how much they knew about the music, the libretto, the costuming, the step sequences, and yeah. so forth. And if they couldn't hit sort of more than 55 or 65 percent on all the metrics across the board, they wouldn't even consider reconstructing the work because it would be really just their own reflection on what it might have been without yeah. Um, at least having the part that they had here, we're preserving these puzzle pieces that we have, though we're framing them now with maybe um, some new elements that try to help us see them. So you mentioned Swan Lake. Sure. Um, so w what do we really know about Swan Lake at this point? Then? We know that Swan Lake is the most difficult vexed ballet to figure out when you actually see it. Um, you wouldn't believe how many articles are written on uh, Swan Lake. My take on Swan Lake is that it's um, an interesting case because it doesn't depend on the step sequences to be the same ballet at all. It's much more like um, a, a play script. The libretto seems to be the more important thing, maybe along with some of the really important musical choices that were from the early kind of canonical versions of the ballet. Sure. But the choreography, as is the case with almost all classical and romantic ballets, is extremely variable. Um, and so you don't really want to pin too much on that if you yeah. want to know, did I see Swan Lake? But this is also why with those kinds of ballets, people will say things like, well, I saw Kent Stoll's Swan Lake, or I saw Matthew Bourne's Swan Lake. Yeah. With those ballets, we're allowed to make choreographic changes and invited to do so. But no one would ever say, Gee, I saw Tom Roach's performance of Balanchine's Agon, right? That would be really bad. You're not allowed <laughs> to change Balanchine's step sequences. <laughs> so I think there's a real difference depending on what tradition and dance um, these works come from. And Swan Lake is a, a fascinating one. Even just the Wikipedia article is yeah. dense and fascinating. So I'd recommend it. Is there any uh, comparison between this and uh, trying to recreate a play, for instance? Because where the actor yep. looks when delivering a line or something. I saw uh, this, uh, this amazing. Uh, uh, production of Hamlet in Chicago once, and uh, it was sort of one of those, uh, uh, you know, 20th century versions, mm -hmm. you know, and so there's a street gang and, and they're fighting and all that, and um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the famous scene with the soliloquy opens and uh, the character who plays Hamlet comes out with a can of spray paint and he sprays to be or not to be on this wall. <laughs> and without saying anything, he turns to the audience and pounds the wall and he says, that is the it's question. The question. <laughs> nice. But that's really taking some liberties with the script. But, um, but I assume there's some parallels there, right? Absolutely. In fact, yeah. the original people who wrote about reconstruction that I relied yeah. on in my dissertation wrote about theater reconstruction. Um, okay. So the dance, uh, the drama review was a place where they had a nice big debate rolling in the 80s that I used to try to um, inform some of the work I was doing, thinking about the specific sort of odd cases, again, in the dance scenario, yeah. because we don't have the script. Here you say, well, yeah. you're taking liberties. They didn't really take liberties with the script there. No. What was taken liberties with is the stylistic yeah. representation of Shakespeare's yeah. words. But we're in an the even physical worse position, right? Yeah. right? Yeah. Because we don't really know what Pavlova right. did. Do you know what right. I mean? Right. Yeah, and yeah. that's what made me think of that, because yeah. you've got so much more to work with mm -hmm. uh, if you're looking at a play. 
They raise the same metaphysical issues, though, and appreciative issues. And further, this, this question that your case brings up, um, that comes up a lot in our literature on this stuff, which is, well, wait, why should we want to do it in the old way? Why should we want to reconstruct right. the old? Come on, let's do it in the modern way with yeah. the spray paint can. That speaks to our time. That's bringing Shakespeare into the now. Only the antiquated person who's looking backward really wants to see it performed as they do it at the Globe. Uh, or maybe you want to because you're a tourist. Um, but there's a there's a kind of feeling from yes, a large contingent of the dance community <laughs> that yeah. the reconstructions um, fall flat in terms of sharing dance with us going forward because they don't speak to our sensibilities now. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I, I just if we've got a, a minute left here, um, one of the issues that you write about is grace. Mm -hmm. um, right. Tell me a little bit about how that fits in with your research. So um, grace is a fascinating aesthetic property to me. Aestheticians love to work out um, what does it take for something to be unified or ugly or elegant or what is an aesthetic property. And it occurred to me early on that aestheticians almost never talked about dance unless they wanted to drop in a ballet example as an example of grace. And I thought, well, gee, then philosophers of dance should have a lot to, a lot to say about what grace is. And it turned out that we had absolutely nothing to say so far. And I thought this was a fascinating case because grace is a kind of crossover property. It's an aesthetic property, right, that you might think of attributing to the ease of a kind of movement. Okay. Um, it certainly also has ethical overtones, right? Having social grace seems to have some corresponding relationship to exhibiting aesthetic grace. Yeah. And then it has spiritual overtones. The kind of harmony of the things around you, yeah. Yeah, these spiritual religious overtones of being in a state of grace. Um, so I think it's actually really an interesting thing to separate out these three different kinds of properties um, that we might call instances of grace and also see uh, how they intertwine with one another so that we have a tendency to describe something as graceful uh, rather than as, say, elegant, which is a slightly different term. It has a slightly different connotation. And uh, apparently the dancers are supposed to know something about that. So yes. I thought I would, uh, I would give it a try. Um, so graceful, what's, what's an example for you? What's an example for me? Yeah. Um, I, as in full of grace, right? As in full of grace. Yes. So the examples that I like to use are uh, generally not high-end dance examples, but instead Just a little one bit more quick low one before end. Before we go, uh, Fred and Ginger. Fred and Ginger, very good. Okay, yeah. one dancing forwards and one dancing backwards. Mm -hmm. That's all the time we have for our program. Thank you uh, to Dr. Renee Conroy for joining us today, the Kelly Roundtable, and uh, I'm your host, Tom Roach. Have a great day.